All right, welcome everybody to the ATL podcast, um, ATL baseball podcast. I've got Ryan Rummick here we're from Denison University. Going to join us on our first one that we're recording. We're trying something new, uh, something that I think will be beneficial to a lot of our parents and players, and hopefully, you know, their friends and whoever decides to tune in. Um, I brought Roman to be my first guinea pig guest because we've we go back a ways. Um, I'm sure, we'll get to get into that today. And he's one of the most well-spoken, thoughtful individuals I know. I thought he could shed some light and help us uh, dig deeper into the recruiting side of it. So, Rome, why don't you uh, go ahead and give me a little bit of background of you know your coaching, playing um, before we get going here today. Yeah, first, uh, thanks for having me on, Shep, and uh, I hope I don't embarrass you. Um, I know too much about you, so um, I think, uh, first off, I uh, played Division One baseball at Akron um, a decent while ago, uh, then started coaching um, Division Two baseball in West Virginia. Uh, that's where I ran into Mr. Shepard, um, and then went from there to Denison. I uh, was here for a couple years, got the pitching job at Dayton was at UD for three years, went to Ohio University for uh, about a year and a half, then got married, um, took my old job back at Denison, um, moved back to Columbus, um, and been back for, I think this is six years now back. So I've uh, been around the, the block a little bit, a bunch of different levels of baseball. Uh, uh, obviously played there and then and then coached a bunch of different levels. So uh, it's been a little bit of a journey. Yeah, I think, um, you know, aside from being able to, get your point across and, and articulate yourself very well. I, th I think one of the reasons why I thought you'd be perfect to be on here first is you've, you've been at all the different levels. Um, you've seen so much baseball. And I, I think my goal when I first thought about doing this was I, I didn't want to get on here and ask you 15 of the most you know frequent asked questions that people get because every time you have a coach on, you're going to hear almost all the same answers. I'd, you know, when I sent you, I said, what do you want to talk about? I, I think I framed it as like, what, you know, what drives you up a wall or, you know, what what gets you out of bed in the morning? And the first thing that you said to me was, you know, what the different levels of baseball look like, which is kind of a nice little smooth transition in our first topic today. And I, I, you being everywhere, I really think you can identify that almost better than anybody. So go ahead and take that and run with it. and. Yeah, I think I think honestly, it's just it's it's interesting because I think a lot of people fail to have a ton of perspective as to what they mean when they say certain things like, "Oh, this guy's a Division One guy," and then if you immediately ask, "What's that?" Mean? Um, I think a lot of people can't really articulate that. Um, they just think, "Oh, well, this guy's pretty good, so he must be a Division One guy." And I think um, once you see the different levels, there's um, there's so much that goes into that that really just looking at a guy's ability or his athleticism or his arm strength, his bat speed, whatever, um, doesn't really qualify you to play at any certain level um, because there's, there's all that gray in recruiting. There's this, you know, this big bunch of fog that goes around um, what team need and what type of players they like and what the academic requirements are and all those things. So really, um, and inside of each of the levels, there's so much discrepancy as far as the talent level, right? There's there's really high level Division three schools that um, would be fine playing in, uh, you know, certain small mid major Division one conferences. They would be fine. I'm not saying they'd win them, um, but they'd be fine. They would compete. Mm -hmm. um, where there's also some Division one teams that um, would have trouble with some. JUCO. I mean, some JUCOs are better than a lot of Division One teams. Oh, it's yeah. just crazy the discrepancy inside of each of the levels. So, saying that really doesn't mean much of anything. I think people, you know, back to my original point. I think some people just need to have the perspective, and they don't have it because they don't go watch games. They don't like turn on a live stream. You know, ESPN Plus is such a great thing now because they cover so much college baseball. So you can see a lot of there. You can go on teams' websites and follow a live stream and watch. You can watch us play every game. Um, so it's it's interesting, but I think some people just need to take the time to watch and see what the levels look like. And then I think you have a little bit better grasp of, okay, this level's different than I thought it was, or this team is different than I thought it was. 
that's one of the biggest things um you know when i'm talking to guys in our program about where they fit in or uh it doesn't even have to be our program it'd be anybody it's when's the last time you went and watched a college baseball game you know and mm-hmm. i don't think guys go you obviously pulling up live streams is great but if you if you went and watched you know emory play denison washu play denison um it would blow your mind at the arms you see coming out of the bullpen and you know i think one of the misconceptions is vision three you're going to be trotting out guys that are throwing 75 left and right and that's just not the case at all you know what i mean yeah. if if you know you're not mid 80s with two pitches that you can control sometimes three it depends how good the team's going to be i mean you you won't even see them out in division three i mean and just going to watch the games that's the biggest thing i always recommend that um you know, we had a kid looking at Emory and Washu, and went and watched a Washu Emory game. Oh my God, I yeah. had no idea. And you know, they get off the bus and they look good. You know, they're big, they're strong. Yeah. Like, hey, if you want to be a Division Three baseball player, you got to even go up more levels than you are. So, yeah, and I, I think too, like the funny part is um, now you it's you can just say it and say that oh man they're really good and i think you know they can compete at different levels or whatever but now the point's kind of been proven with the with the covid years that people got you're seeing division three guys um have grad years left and go play and go play power five baseball and play um you know and and you know, now in the past you know there you can look at the draft and say okay well, it's only 20 around 20 rounds now so um, like a lot of Division three guys aren't getting drafted, but they're they're playing Pro Bowl. I mean, Wash U there for a couple of years ago. We played them in a regional. Their their number one is in AAA with I think the Cardinals, and their their shortstops in AAA I think with the Yankees. I'm not I'm not sure exactly where he's at, but like that's two guys on the field that are in AAA right now. In just a few years, um, they're really rising. So they're just there's just a lot of really good players. Obviously, I think there's a big difference in depth when you look at levels, like with scholarship money and and things like that. There's Division One teams that have a lot more depth, I think, than some Division Three teams. But uh, when you look at the top end talent and some of the best players in the country in Division Three, they're really, really good baseball players. So um, it's it's uh, it's interesting. Yeah, the the depth thing is always the biggest difference. Um, uh, you you might have two through five hitters can compete with a lot of the Division One guys, but Division One guys, they're just gonna have a lot more of them. And I mean that's you know just having the different levels and and whatnot and um you know uh I guess we'll move on to the next next question of or next topic you wanted to speak on is being recruited versus being mass communicated with and um I love that you brought these topics up because it's some of the, the most questions I get from parents and. From players and sometimes it feels like I'm the bad guy or the bearer of bad news when it's a mass communication email and you have to say that and um, or it just they hear what they want to hear sometimes and that's you know my job makes it a little bit tough because it's I'm not always trusted so why don't you go hot go ahead and just expound upon the difference between being recruited versus mass communication yeah, it, it's um, yeah, it's just part of this business, right? There's um, there's there's obviously at the, at the end of the day, there are um, people trying to make money, you know, doing this and trying to pay some assistant coaches. So sometimes camps are designed as money making camps. Sometimes they're not. They're just um, like we have we have one prospect camp we run, and we honestly we've talked a lot about trying to add a second one just because. Um, sometimes that weekend doesn't work for good players and they can't make it to campus and things like that. Some people play football, so camps in the fall are tough. Um, but we run one and it's usually small and it's, and doesn't cost very much to come. We use it as a real big recruiting tool where some people are going to run five prospect camps and, and they're blowing them out and they're sending out, you know, uh, they're nuking the, the email chains with, you know, uh, just saying, hey, come to this, come to this, or whatever. So I think there's there's some of that, obviously. But I think, um, honestly, I think it's just having some feel as far as what type of personal touch this communication has to it. 
And are you actually speaking with somebody? Um, and if you are, who is it? Is it the director of ops or is it the recruiting coordinator? Um, and does that communication go farther than just, hey, come to camp and that's it? Or, you know, is there a phone call? Is there text messages back and forth? Is there communication maybe with your coaches, your summer coaches, um, your high school coach? Things like that start to add layers of personal touch to it that you can say, okay, th there is a genuine interest from that side. Like maybe you're interested, but are they also as interested as you are? Um, and so once you get into that, then you can start to feel, okay, well, this is, feels more like a recruiting process than just a reach out with a feeler and say, hey, you think you can come to camp? Um, you know, and there's, you know, there's obviously different layers to that. It's not just like cut and dry what it is, but um, a lot of that, I think, is where players have to use that feel of, does this feel like a genuine interest or does this just feel like a, hey, how's it going? We got a camp on Tuesday. Yeah. On slide over. Um, well, and that's. The other part of it is too, it's, it's kind of where it, both can be true where it can be a money maker, but it also can be a recruiting tool where they may not know who, they may not know who you are. And if you trust your summer coach, if you trust your recruiting guy, your high school coach, and they say, "Yeah, maybe it's not a genuine in interest from Coastal Carolina, but you're good enough to pitch there. They've just not seen you throw. Yeah, go there and you know let it eat. You know we we had a player fortunate enough to commit to Georgia Tech recently, and he went to their, you know, he really wanted to go to Georgia Tech, and he went to their camp, and, you know, we sent out the communication on our part, and said, hey, we have this kid coming, like, he's, you know, he's pretty athletic, he can throw, he can, you know, he's, a lot of movements on the mound are, are repeatable, and it's good. Take a look at him. I don't think they've seen him throw much before, and, you know, he wows him and gets a scholarship, and or gets a roster spot offer, and it's like, he's committed. So, you know, I, uh, I tell people both can be true because there's, you know, people you, you can't possibly go see everybody. You know what I mean? Um, especially right. like at, at Denison, you don't have the resources to do it. So some people come to camp and you don't know anything about them, but like they've researched Denison, they've looked Denison up. They're like, yo, I want to go to Denison. And you come in, you're like, holy crap, like this kid is, is legit. And yeah, I, I think so much more of it too. And I'll touch on this because you just mentioned it. Um, it's so big for players to there's a, there's a lot of like recruiting services out there. There's a lot of um, people that will say they'll help you through this process, but I think you have to be really leery about it um, in a sense that as coaches, like having trust in the information that you're getting is massive and that can be good or bad information. Oh. But if you don't, if you don't trust it, um, it's really tough and it almost hurts players sometimes when you have untrustworthy people speaking on your behalf because then you start to even doubt what you're seeing in a video or doubt what you're seeing in stats. Um, so, you know, having having people like you and Gio and, and people in your organization reach out for a player who have coached and coached at a, at a high level and then also um, have been in baseball for a long time and have seen a lot of levels of players, having someone reach out on your behalf that not just sells every single thing down the street says hey this kid can do this and he can't do this we understand like you know college coaches are are not naive to the fact that these guys are not finished products like they're going to be things that they have to develop and work on once they get to your campus but we'd like to know what those are and if someone can't basically um lay out the 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 profile of this player and say he's really good at this he's not so good at this he's really solid here he needs to work on this when you hear those things you go okay like yeah i get it like we we can we can work with this like we can we'll put some mass on his frame we'll get him a little bit quicker we'll help him with his arm strength we'll help him you know with his throwing accuracy whatever those negatives are but when someone calls you and says this guy's a no doubter he plays for you and it's like Seen us play like you don't know if he can play out and you don't know who's on our roster so don't tell me you know he can play because we 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 don't even know if some of the guys we have in our program can play we, we're still figuring that out so uh, for you to say that you he definitely can play is a different story so i think having those trustworthy individuals behind you is massive it's so funny that you said that because um 
No, I'm just going to say it. We had a kid in our program commit to a school. Um, you don't have to sell yourself down the river right here. It's okay. And before he committed to that school, I reached out. You know, I had a really great relationship with the school. Reached out and said, hey, like, I got a kid for you. And he goes, you know, that name sounds familiar. What do I know the name from? And and this kid had uh, signed on to a recruiting service, a, a guy. And, you know, the guy sends out a mass Word document with all his guys. Mm-hmm. And the coach was like, yeah, I would have never looked at him because anytime I get, you know, an email with those kids on it, I just fuck them up to they suck. And, you know, maybe true, maybe not. You know, this kid was on that email, but then the, this coach came to our camp and then our player went to his camp after that. And, you know, he's going to be going, going and playing there. And you know, I won't throw anybody on the bus mentioning any names, but it's like, the recruiting service is almost like the mass email communication from camps, right? Like there's no personal touch because a lot of times there's not that built relationship. Whereas, you know, we have two players and, and this takes us is a great transition. I'm, I'm getting this thing down. It takes us right into handling the process the right way. We got two guys at your program already, uh, mm-hmm. Fishbine and, and steel, um, you know, and we had a couple other kids looked at, Denison for yep. 2024 class and you know unfortunately it didn't work out but yeah. talk to me about handling that process the right way and and you know it's something that I harp on our guys so much about and and maybe they only do it because I, I I harp on them I like to think they do it because they're good humans but yeah talk to what what do you guys say about handling the process the right way yeah again I think it's just um I think I think it's just understanding that we're just human beings. We're not perfect either. As coaches make mistakes, and we make mistakes in evaluating players. Um, we try not to make mistakes on on making sure that we're getting good good people. Um, but when when people just um, like I said, like missing a layer of communication or whatever, that's okay. Like it happens sometimes, and I get that. But as long as you have this, like um, where you feel like there's some there's some empathy from their side, and there's some empathy from your side, right? Uh, in that process. Um, and, and you go through the process and we, we constantly communicate, communicate about trying to find the right fit for us and for them. Um, and sometimes that's not us and that's okay. We understand that. Um, we're going to recruit, you know, a few hundred kids every time we're trying to, to get down to getting a class of 12 or something. So we're, we hear no a lot and that's okay. Um, just like I'm sure players hear no a lot, but, um, you have to understand it's not personal. It's not um it, it's not it's not this game where you're trying to win everything it, you're just looking for a good fit because at the end of the day you want them to be comfortable where they are and sometimes when people force that they they force that selection um and coaches do the same way we force ourselves onto a player and really want to like them and sometimes that doesn't work out and it's actually there were so many red flags along the way where we should have probably stepped away or the player should have stepped away because the fit wasn't right um and and so when players do it the right way and they communicate and they say hey here's my list of schools and here's where i am right now um sometimes you try to sort your way through it and you say you know are you sure that's exactly where you want to go or are you sure that the location is that big of a deal are you sure that the academics are that big of a deal um and once you hear their answers you like you just have to be okay with their selection process um and the same thing i think has to happen for players and when they hear it from us, sometimes players take it personally. Um, you know what? Hey, we don't need another catcher. We already got a catcher in this class. And um, sometimes those things happen. We can't carry seven catchers. Um, so when that conversation happens, you hope that players take it the appropriate way. Uh, but they're 18, 17, 18 years old. So sometimes they don't. But um, when players do it the right way, they call, they say, hey, look, this is a really tough decision, but this is this is where I want to be. And, you know, I thank you for the process. I thank you for the, you know, the interactions, the conversations, um, whatever. Um, it's great. It's fine. And that's exactly the way it should be handled. But um, those conversations aren't tough either for a 17-year-old. So to make that phone call and have an awkward conversation with a 
37 year old coach and say, Hey, I'm not choosing your school. Sometimes it's tough, um, but that's okay. Hopefully coaches around the country do a good job of being considerate when that phone call is made. I know I try to, I'm like, Hey, congrats, man. That is an, that is an awesome thing that you made this choice and you found a good school for you and your family. Um, I try to do that every time. Um, but uh, sometimes they sting and you know, you go, okay, well, you know, good luck, man. And, and yeah. um, yeah, you you hope that happens around the country. I'm not sure it does, but you know, I think there's happens. there's you know obviously college coaches you know it, it's it's a fraternity be, and I was on the other side of it and it's 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 you know you being nice and saying good luck is usually not what you want to say, but they're now being on the other side of it. There's definitely you know coaches that don't handle it the right way, but the same college coaches will. You know, be pissed off at a kid if they don't handle it the right way. So it's definitely a two-way street. I mean, that, when he reached out and said, "I, I, th I think I'm going to commit uh, elsewhere other than Denison," you know, what should I do? I said, "Call Rome and tell him that." Tell him, and he was like, "What do I say?" I said, "Just tell him you don't want to. Your Denison's not not in your consideration anymore, and just tell him why." He was like, "Well, what? You know, is he going to be mad?" I'm like. Brother, Rome has been told no before, and he'll be fine. Like, he'll handle it. He, he's good. But I said, what you don't want to do is just string him along or not say anything. So he's wondering, like, yo, is this kid still, you know, considering us? Is, is you know, are, are, are we in, in consideration? Because I said, cause they have a list as well, you know. I said, so you just need to reach out and just tell him, just be honest about it. You know, and that's it. That's all. I mean, that's all. That's all guys want. So it is tough, though, for seventeen-year-old kids. I mean, especially when the you hear that they did it the right way, and then the coach was, you know, treating him like not great. Um, I, th I think too, the the best way to kind of, I think the helpful way to explain it to players is it is it is beneficial to us to get the no. Oh, 100%. it's not been. It's not beneficial for us if you if you know and I and I think this is the tough part for young kids is I think they know they actually know really soon whether or not it's a good fit or not um, but they don't want to pull that plug um, whether it's they want to keep this card in the deck still or um, maybe they think they can convince themselves or whatever or they just are afraid to say no um, but honestly it's beneficial to college coaches. If players after visits or whatever know it's not a good fit and just do it right away, call, say, hey, um, I really appreciate all the time, but this just wasn't the place for me, didn't feel right, whatever. Um, and that actually helps the college out. It helps us out because now we can start going down the list and, okay, he's done. Now we'll move on to the next guy and try to, you know, work this relationship and see where that goes. Um, so, yeah, I think it, if players would understand that, I know that's tough, but it's actually better for us if, if they know it's not a good fit to just make the phone call and say, hey, it's not going to work out. I'm going to go, you know, I'm going to explore other options. But what if guys, what if it's not like love at first sight and it's like, I like Denison, like, you know, maybe. But it's my first one, you know, or I've had one other one. I like that other place a little bit better, but I don't know if I'm going to get an offer from the other place. Yeah. But I don't want to tell Rome to go kick rocks because, I mean, like from a college coach's perspective, you know how it goes. It's if a kid comes in and he's wishy washy and you weren't maybe his top choice, he may come in and just fall in love with it because college baseball is awesome. It's one of the most fun times we've had our best friends have come from college baseball but that kid that comes in wishy-washy also has a hot you know if it's 50 50 there's a chance he may come in and be like i'm done after one semester i knew i shouldn't have come here and and so I, how would you tell kids to handle that or how would you want kids to handle that yeah i, I think um again i think it's i understand that there's a process that we're going through as well so uh you know um being a school like like ours, we don't have a we don't have like a, a roster. Some some Division three schools are gonna have a roster of fifty five or sixty kids. We keep our roster is forty. So um, when we we're not throwing out you know 
15 offers to arms, you know, we're going to bring in four or five arms a year. Um, and understand that, hey, when our situation changes, we're going to tell you, like, so it's sometimes we can't wait around, like we can't. Um, you know, we also have, you know, just like most high academic schools, we have early decision periods and there's there's some deadlines that we have to hit. So um, we can't necessarily wait around months to, to wait for a guy to figure it out. Um, but um, again, I think if that's the case and you go and you go, I liked it. I'm not sure that's perfect spot right now, you know, and, or I liked it, but there's also these three other visits I have. As long as you communicate those things, it's fine. Um, I'm going to tell you the same thing. I'm going to say, hey, look, I'm going to talk to other people. And if this situation with us changes and we need to go in a different direction, I'm going to tell you. Um, and so know that this opportunity, it doesn't like last forever. Um, for some guys, maybe it does. If they're really, really good, you can go, hey, take as much time you need. You want to you want to decide in three years, I'll wait around, we'll figure it out. But for some guys, um, their ability is not at such a high level that you have to, you know, treat them like a number one draft pick. You're going, hey, look, I'm I'm trying to fill out an arm spot here. I'm going to move on and I'm going to try to find another guy that fits. It's like the hot crazy scale? Similar. I, I Similar. Gio always yells at me and Ace when I say this, so I'm going to just say it on the first one that we're recording. Recruiting is so much just like dating. I mean, there's there's so many similarities, you know, between you know how you meet people and how do you get in front of college coaches and you know, how do you decide which one's for you and you, know, you don't. I always tell guys you want to go take more than one visit, even if your first visit is the one that you fall in love with. You got to go take another visit to be sure, right? Because like your first visit is it's amazing. Like you have a college coach sure. that's giving you all your his attention and telling you how great you are and makes you feel good and you're like this is awesome this is the best thing ever. But if you don't go take another visit to see, did I really feel like that or was I just wowed by that moment? You know, sure. was did I love the school? Did I love what they had to say and all that stuff? So, um, no. I th I, yeah. I, I I'm not going to touch dating life, but I, I can understand your sentiment. Uh, <laughs> all right, recruiting perspective. Um, I think when you messaged me about that, um, you had elaborated a little bit more, but uh, you talked about roster needs, trying to recruit more than just backups. Um, you know, how, how, do, how, how do you go about doing that? Yeah, I, uh, I think when we were talking initially, I, I was bringing up points about, again, just understand there's a, the there's another side of this. It's not just like you trying to find a school. There's the school trying to play their own game. It's the admissions department trying to play their own game. Um, so once you you know have a little bit of perspective on what uh, what is being, I guess, trying to be executed by the team. Um, so if we are, you know, have a positional need for middle infielders and don't have a need for outfielders and you're an outfielder, this may not be the, the right fit. The timing is just off or whatever. Um, and so I think when players go into this process, sometimes it's just like, uh, you know, they think it's like a, a, a pickup game on the playground and you're just trying to pick the best players. Um, but sometimes you have to understand that there's a whole other roster that's there already. Um, there's guys that are graduating. There's guys that may be a shortstop right now and may be transitioning to left field or center field. So now that outfield unit's getting kind of bogged down. Um, so, yeah, I think, um, you know, there's obviously a little bit more grace for players that play, you know, middle positions that can be moved, like center field and like shortstop, second baseman, that you can move around a little bit. Your corner guys are kind of log jammed. Your catchers are log jammed. Your your arms are what they are. Everybody needs arms typically. Um, but again, you know, even inside of that, there's there's depth that maybe you need. Maybe we have five or six starters that are young that we feel good about, but we need, you know, some relief help. Somebody with some really, really good secondary stuff that can come into a game and, and get through an, a, a lineup one time. Um, so, again, you're looking at all those things. Um, and 
with the the caveat that yeah we still need good players we're not going to try to you know recruit players that we think can just slide in behind this guy we're trying to find guys that are as good or better than what we already have um and sometimes when you go watch an inter-squad scrimmage or whatever you go i can play look at that guy and you may not have the understanding that you're pointing out the 28th 9th 29th guy on the roster um, who doesn't have an at bat and he's working through some things just like everybody else does but um yeah, that's that's the perspective I'm talking about. Sometimes I think players just look and go, I'm pretty good. I think I can go there. Um, why don't they want me? And it's like, well, there's a lot of layers. Yeah, I mean, we I just deal with that on the opposite end of it where, you know, kids with perfect game now, you can look up, you know, kids want to go to Georgia Tech, for example, and they're like, well, I, I looked at so-and-so's recruiting profile that's going there or is there now, and he was throwing 83 or he throws – 86 and I throw 88 why am I not getting recruited I just you know metrics are super important and super high up there but personally what each coach looks for is so different and each coach has different eyes and Mm -hmm. it's not always it metrics matter like they get your foot in the door right like if I tell you I got a kid that's throwing 72 and I want you to take a look at him you're going to tell me to go kick rocks you know there's a threshold, mm-hmm. but if I tell you, hey, I got a kid that's 84 to 86, uh, two-pitch mix, whatever, that's at least going to get you there. Now, I know you won't recruit anybody that accidentally cuts their fastball because you think that means that they can't control it, and, and I know all the little things that you know makes Ryan tick, but at least the, the beginning metrics get you in the door, and I, I think you know when, we're, when I'm telling my, my guys and our, our players about know why recruiting video is important or why metrics are important is because you know that's like the outer beauty before they get to know you right like that's like oh wow like that kid his exibilio is like 96 like that's that's great or this kid runs a 6-4 like you know what i mean and if you just don't like those kids that are aren't showcase players it's so the kid the kids that you gotta go watch right it's like mm-hmm. For me, for example, when you coached me when I played, I, I would have never got recruited out of a showcase, ever. I was a guy you had to go watch because I didn't do anything metrically that was great. I was slow. I didn't hit bombs. You know, I I probably didn't throw that hard. and None of that was great. So you had to just watch me over time. But guys that can pop 88 on the mound, like that's going to get you come see him that's gonna get you in the door so you know, a lot and of that's the, that's the part of this process though that that i think um is more and more getting driven out of out of the game and that that stinks it's but it's it's just a little bit of the truth um is that um you know we we call it playing winning baseball and the ability to understand how the game is won and lost what the what the important things are in the game of baseball is not actually what the important things are when the recruiting process starts. So um, things like, um, you know, being able to handle a running game and being able to field your position and being able to have a dual focus with runners on base as a pitcher and, and, you know, pitch from behind the count and, and things like that, they don't matter in a recruiting process. Not initially. They don't. Um, So, Again, I think one, the tough, honest truth about the game of baseball right now where it's at is that, especially for smaller schools, a lot of recruiting is done in these little snapshots of, hey, this guy threw threw a 12-pitch bullpen. Like, did he pop or not? And you have, you don't know anything about him as a pitcher. You just know, I like the way his arm works. Uh, mechanically, he looks fairly clean. And he, you know, he spun the ball pretty well, blah, blah, blah. 12 pitches, it means nothing. And it may have been the best 12 pitches of his life. Um, but, you know, there's there's also, um, again, it goes back to relationships. And that's where a lot of our recruiting has kind of went um, as a program. With, and Coach Deegan's been in college baseball for a long time and, and, and a very um, has a very great reputation with a lot of really um, good baseball people around the country. So there's there's people that we can lean into and say, Hey, look, we saw this video. It's not bad. What do you got? And almost like right away, there's, 
you know, I can name people in Chicago and people in D.C. and people in the Northeast and people down in Atlanta and people in Charlotte that we can call and and they're probably going to have a pulse. And they're also trustworthy people that sometimes you call them and they go, you're not going to like it. Um, you know, he's he's this, he's flashy, but he can't play like doesn't he's not a team guy, whatever. He's a and one then, he's a one six to the plate. And if you tell him to speed it up a little bit. Get those strikes right. all over the right. place. So, so you get some of that, and then you know sometimes you call and you go, "Hey, this video is just okay. What do you got?" And he's like, "No, he's an absolute dude. He's if we're gonna play tomorrow for my paycheck, I'm putting him on the mound." It's like, okay, I want that guy. Then I want I need another one guy like that. Um, so there's there's those conversations. The relationships are big um, because. You're right. the The recruiting process is a little boiled down to, right now to just some eye popping metrics that everybody kind of has a, like you said, a threshold or a survival ship bias of this is the number that we can't take anybody below it. Um, but sometimes those guys right there in the middle are guys that can really play the game. They know how to win. Those are the best guys. Where it's they don't, you know, they're not the five o'clock hitters. Maybe they don't crush bombs and BP, but like they're the guys that are going to be dudes for you. Um, yeah. So, all right. Uh, I think that covers everything they want to talk about today. And then we'll just finish on the lightning round. Um, ask you some questions. Give me short, quick, fast answers. Yes. Whatever yeah. comes to mind. Is a hot dog a sandwich? No. Favorite player you've ever coached? Mm. Better say me. Mm. But for the sake of the, my time, I'll just say Mike Shepard. Uh, <laughs> favorite place. Favorite place you've lived. Favorite place I've lived. For a small period of time, or just like actually had a house or apartment. Small period, six months minimum. Mm. Um, favorite city. Athens, Ohio. Oh, you did live there. It's because you played video yeah. game. You played video games in the uh, coaches' lounge. The four yeah, in the morning. Yeah. Um, that's all I got, man. That was quick. I know. Ran out of questions. We covered everything, you know. So it felt like we that thirty-eight minutes felt like it was much longer. So 